Pressure heats up inside the Capitol, and rain tries to dampen the festivities outside. We explain in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The House and Senate have passed their respective tax bills, and now it's time to try and work out some key differences. Here is a look at some of the key differences between the two plans and the governor's recommendations. The Senate and governor raise $1.8 billion in new revenue. The House is at $2.6 billion. All three increase the rate on the state's wealthiest earners, but there are big differences on those income levels. The Senate plan would expand sales tax to include services and clothing, but would lower the overall rate to 6%. All three plans would increase the price of cigarettes. Governor Mark Dayton says he will push for so, his plan. I mean, the House has its differences, the Senate has its, and you know, that's their prerogative. They're all elected in their own right as, as well as I's. But I do think that, you know, mine focuses, raises the revenue necessary uh, to meet my budget, and, you know, I'm going to argue that point strongly. Chair of the Senate Taxes Committee, Rod Scoy, joins me now to talk about the final package that was passed off the Senate floor Monday evening. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Oh, it's real nice to be here, Julie. Senator, let's begin with the priorities that your bill reflect um, to Minnesotans. You know, you've got modernizing the tax system, broaden, broadening the base, lowering the rate, closing corporate loop, loopholes. How do you think these changes would impact Minnesotans if they stand as they as they do? Well, I think we need to look first at the first priority of the session, and that really was to balance the budget. And uh, everybody committed to balancing this budget, not just for this biennium, but for the for the next biennium also, trying to pay a little more attention to what's going on in the future to make sure that we don't bounce from one deficit to the next. And so, first of all, the Senate bill does that. We filled the $627 million hole. And if that's what we succeed in getting this session, it'll be a success. But over and above that, there's a number of areas that we invest in, education being the primary one. Uh, talked on the floor yesterday about the importance of the K-12 uh, bill, the all-day K, uh, the money going into our earliest learners, and then of course the the money for uh, college students, uh, filling some of the base needs of our public schools and universities, and 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 the the very important issue of the state grant. So balancing the budget, investing in ourselves through workforce uh, development, through education, those have to be the priorities that we set. And you know I think we accomplished those. We we uh, paid for them. No shifts. No gimmicks. Uh, yes, we raised some revenue to do that, but that is one of the differences is when uh, we, we, when we want to accomplish things, we actually pay for them. And your provision broadens the sales tax, but it also lowers the base rate to 6%. The Senate, or excuse me, the House does not have this provision, and the governor hasn't really said if he would support it or not support it. So what are the chances? Obviously, it's difficult to pontificate, but as far as a priority, how much of a priority is it for you to try to get this through the conference committee process? Sure, well, since the beginning of session, we have tried to keep the reform separate from the revenue. And we have three primary revenue raisers. We are raising the third tier. Uh, we're freezing the statewide business property tax rate. And there is a cigarette tax increase that's the same as the governor's proposing. Now, the sales tax and the corporate areas, those are reform provisions that came out of the division. We tried to keep those as revenue neutral as we could broaden the base, lower the rate, make changes to the tax system so it'll be better for the future, uh, more stable, n more stable, uh, really more reflective of what uh, our economy is, more representative of what Minnesotans are doing now. And so, you know, we, we think it's good. We think that, uh, that Minnesota getting out of the top three for the corporate tax rate is a good signal to send. Uh, we think getting our sales tax rate down to 6%, which is more middle of the pack, is good. And so uh, we are now having the debate about the changes that reform brings. Because when you broaden the base, some people will be brought in, some people will pay less because the rate's lowered. And so we will, uh, in conference committee, uh, you know, try to bring the House along, try to continue to work with the commissioner and the governor's office on, on the importance of these things. And we've got a couple weeks left to get that accomplished. And another key change, arguably, would be the uh, raising the income tax on the third tier, broadening, lowering the income levels and uh, raising that rate. There is a lot of debate about 
the dollar, the threshold mm -hmm. of taxable mm -hmm. income. $80,000 of taxable income for individuals, $141,000 for married couples. It was brought up on the Senate floor Monday evening that this could be two teachers who both have their master's degree. Do you think that your provision perhaps hits the middle class, which arguably was one of the things you were trying to avoid? Well, it's uh, top 6% of Minnesotans directly, and if you include the marriage penalty interaction, it's the top 7% of Minnesotans. Uh, that means 93% of Minnesotans aren't impacted. Uh, you know, everybody has aspirations to be in the upper income, so, you know, where your perspective of where you fall uh, can vary. Uh, it's $194,000 of gross income, that's the median, to be included in the, in the family of four uh, taxable, the 140000 taxable number. So that's $194,000 of gross income. Uh, head of household, it's uh, 120 some thousand of gross. Uh, uh, single filing separately is the smaller number. Uh, you know, people perceive where they are and will make their own determinations on that. But when you look at the national numbers of accumulation of wealth, uh, the Pew Research study shows that the top 7% of Americans, their wealth has grown by 28%. The other 93%, their wealth has fallen by 5%. So we kind of think that we've hit a pretty good balance there. Uh, we think that when you take into account the tax policy of ability to pay, which the income tax does that best, that we really are trying to get at Minnesotans that have been more successful, have succeeded more in this great state, and have the ability to help us continue that success. Let's talk a little bit about property tax relief. Uh, it was a priority, it's been stated many times, of the Senate DFL, doing this through $160 million in new money. Why don't you explain what it would go for? Well, there's actually considerably more property tax relief than that and in that there. That was the LGA and the buy-downs sure. of the levy, excuse me. So we're, we're targeting the levies through uh, strengthening our partnership with our local units. Uh, county program aid will receive some money. Uh, LGA program, which go to cities, uh, will receive some additional support to help strengthen the partnership. And then we're reinstituting reinstitu an aid program that uh, was eliminated a number of years ago, and that's township aid. We think that all Minnesotans uh, should have some uh, expectation of equitable services. Uh, and then additionally, uh, we are going uh, to try to make reductions in the education levy. In the E-12 bill, there is $150 million of levy reduction, and in the Senate tax bill, we're trying. We're proposing to buy off the bottom $300 of the voter-approved referendum, uh, and equalize that so that it will be more fairly representative of the district's ability to pay that tax. Something that's not in the Senate plan but is in the House plan is what has been called a fifth tier, which is a surcharge on the wealthiest mm -hmm. Minnesotans to pay back the school shift. Is this something you're open to as you head into conference committee? Well, we, we'll consider a, a blink-off mechanism. Uh, you know, there was one of those in the 90s. We had a 10 percent surcharge on all Minnesota income, and, and that helped them fill the gap during those years, and then it, it did blink off. So, you know, we'll, we'll consider that. I, th I think that the purpose for the money to pay back the shift, I think the plan is in place that that will be paid back within a year or so. I'm not sure that we need to move toward such a high tax rate in order to accomplish a goal that appears fully attainable within a very short period of time. So, you know, we'll, we'll consider it, of course, but if the use of the money isn't uh, uh, something that we would be in, you know, line with where we think it should go, we probably wouldn't be interested in it. But you know, that's the conference committee process and we bring different things to the to the table and, and we'll see how that ends up. And you have stated that a key policy, policy change in this bill is the state actually taking an active role in helping with economic development. Why was this, in your opinion, important to incorporate this year? Well, as a legislator who stands and makes uh, discussion points that we should be involved in aids and credits, that we should be involved in education of kids, I think it's important that the state also plays a role in the economic development of projects that are going to pay for those over the next decades. And so as opposed to what we've done in the past, which is count on local communities through TIF districts or abatements uh, to fund these projects, I'm proposing that the state play a role. And we can do that through giving sales tax exemption for construction materials. Uh, we've proposed that in the 3M project in Maplewood. We're proposing the same thing for Emerson out in Shakopee, a comparable uh, proposal for the uh, pharmaceutical company that's discussing coming into Brooklyn Center. Uh, we incorporated that into our Mall of America proposal. We haven't 
quite got there with that one as to whether that works well or not. And then, of course, the, the Destination Medical Center in Rochester. You know, we, we really think it's important to help that city grow as fast as Mayo's proposing to grow. And, you know, you're talking about 30,000 really good jobs coming to the state. And why wouldn't the state play a role in bringing that economic activity to our state? Okay, Senator Rodskoy, we're out of time, but we'll track your legislation through conference committee, of course, and hopefully get you on at the end of session. We appreciate your time. Oh, thank you, Julie. It's been a pleasure. Here to discuss the House tax bill, we have Representative Jim Dabney. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Let's begin with the big picture and encapsulate for our viewers just how the tax bill from the House represents the priorities of the House DFL in particular. Sure. Well, you know, we listened long and hard to Minnesotans on the campaign trail last November, uh, or up to last November, knocking on doors, attending community forums and the like. And we heard some priorities out of Minnesotans. They wanted a balanced budget that was done honestly, pay back the, 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 or fill in the deficit, pay back the school shift, uh, do it in public and in the open. Uh, property tax relief, property taxes have gone up 86% in the last decade, that's too much uh, as we've relied more and more on local governments. Uh, and then look at investments, education, job creation, things like that. So I think our, the House tax bill reflects those priorities that we heard from Minnesotans. Uh, I talk about it as promises made and promises kept. And you're the chair of the Property Tax Reform Division. Discuss how your bill, how this bill, tackles property tax relief and does it go far enough? There's been some criticism that the property tax relief doesn't go necessarily to the homeowners. Well, actually, in the House bill it does. We do a couple of things. One, we do first time in a decade reform of the local government aid system. Uh, that's a significant piece of the relationship between the state and local cities across the state. The central cities, suburbs, regional centers, sub-regional centers, we've got all sorts of different classes of cities, but across the state, a reformed formula that is more understandable. We take it from 17 different criteria used to determine how much a city would get in aid down to uh, eight. The big difference there. We make it more stable and more predictable so that local units of government can engage in more prudent and thoughtful planning because they can predict how much local government aid they're going to get to make sure that quality government services are provided to people equally across the state at an affordable rate. Then we also put uh, increased money and some reform into both the homestead property tax program that does go directly to homeowners and the renter's credit program that goes to renters because of course they pay property taxes too through their rent and what a lot of uh, particularly lower income and, and middle class rental families are finding is we've got a tightening rental market across the state, rents are going up and it's more of a challenge to make those bills and still get the food on the table and the kids uh, fees for after school activities and that sort of thing paid. I want to go back to something that you said earlier as um, you went around and you said you traveled the state and listened to Minnesotans mm -hmm. about what they wanted and um, how to reform the tax structure a bit. Commissioner of Revenue Myron Franz has done something similar and he's toured the state to talk about what he sees as tax reform and he's been a strong advocate of expanding the sales tax but lowering the rate as just one part of the equation. Your proposal does not offer this. Is it something that the House is open to as you go into, into negotiations? I think that's a challenge for us because we're very sensitive to the tax burden that's been shifted on to middle class taxpayers over the last decade, uh, particularly as incomes have, have also not gone up uh, proportionately. The Pew Trust folks uh, out of the East Coast just the other day uh, presented information that between 2009 and 2011, the top 7% of Americans' net worth went up 28%. In those same two years, the 93% of the rest of us, our net worth actually went down 4%. So we're much less uh, 
open to programs, uh, pr proposals that are going to increase taxes on middle class Minnesotans who can't avoid those. Let's talk about income tax. When I asked Senator Scoy about the income tax proposal that's in the Senate provision, he brought up that same study. And their proposal comes in at roughly $141,000 a year in taxable income for married couples as far as an expanding of the third tier and, and raising the income tax rate on that group. The House version comes in at about four hundred thousand yeah. dollars. So that's not a stark difference using the exact same study as kind of criteria. Is there some wiggle room for the House to maybe reduce that rate a bit? You know, it, uh, conference committee is coming up as we're doing this interview. Um, I imagine that there will be a lot of discussion about that. Let me change the question. I'm sorry okay. to interject, but how is it that the House settled on four hundred thousand dollars a year? We're focused on making sure that high-income Minnesotans pay a fair share of their the, their fair share of taxes which means right now what we know is that high income people pay a lower percentage of state and lo local taxes of their income than do middle class Minnesotans we're looking to balance that out let's talk about bringing that up uh, uh, what some are calling the fifth tier, which is the mm -hmm. surcharge that mm -hmm. would blink off to pay back the school shift. The, the Senate doesn't incorporate this, this. The governor seems lukewarm to the idea. How important is it to the House to keep this in? I think you're going to see a big emphasis in the K-12 Education Committee conversations and then particularly in the tax bill where we actually carry the provisions on paying back the school shift. Uh, we heard a lot about that on the doors across the state stop borrowing money from schools, do a honest budget that balances out in public and doesn't include shifts and gimmicks and tricks as we spent the last decade that I've been here balancing the budget. Instead, do it straight up. And the, the surcharge on the highest income earners in the state, as you said, $400,000 for a household uh, adjusted gross income, they're probably making close to $500,000 a year. They can help balance uh, the budget and pay back particularly the school shift with a, because they benefit hugely from the services the, the state provides. Representative Dabney, I think it's fair to say that the House and the Senate had the same ultimate goals in crafting their bills, just going about different ways of doing it, and the governor as well. So take us into the conference committee process if you can a bit, and how do you see reconciliation in some of the, the real, the stark area, the areas with real stark contrast? You know, I think there is going to be a lot of conversation going on, because you're right. I think we have very similar goals. Uh, there's always some little different politics. Uh, the Senate isn't up for four more years, that, or three more years, I guess. The House is up next year. Uh, we always like to think our, ourselves as a little more attuned to where people in Minnesota are uh, and a little bit more responsive. The governor, uh, I think, is going to play a key role in his coming in and saying, here are the parameters of what I'll accept. Is there an extra layer of um, perhaps pressure, for lack of a better word, knowing that Minnesotans elected an all-DFL legislature because they were tired, what we heard, they were tired of the gridlock. So is there an emphasis on getting the job done and getting it done on time? We will be measured by the results of this session. And I think that includes getting done on time. And when people sit back, you know, maybe not the weekend after the, the session, that's not the best time to, to look over our work, but a few months later when they see that their kids' school is better funded, that tuition has been frozen at the university or the Minsky system, that they actually are getting property tax relief while getting greater uh, local services out of their, their city, some things like that, I think they're going to feel very good about what happened uh, in this session. Representative Jim Daphne, thank you for coming in and talking about your proposal. We appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. On Tuesday, the governor introduced the board that will be responsible for managing and operating the new health insurance marketplace known as Minsure. Many of them discussed the challenges that now lie ahead. We need to really address the diversity of needs in the state and have products that are going to be appropriate for small businesses, for people in public assistance of a variety of kinds, and for individuals who are looking for how do I figure out what kind of insurance I can get. And another big thing is using this forum to get the information out there so that people know about it and will use the service because I'm, I'm really excited about what this can do for the people in the state who've struggled trying to find a way to provide their own health care. 
it's not just what insurance program is out there, but it's the communication, it's the education. That's the whole point of the exchange is to do more than just provide a mechanism to purchase insurance, but to help to help the population understand it so they know what fits them and fits their unique situation, and there's gonna be bumps along the road. I've run across people who, had, who lost their jobs in their 50s, early 60s, are not yet eligible for Medicare, scrambling to try to find how to make healthcare affordable for themselves, and in the rules in the individual market, folks, older people pay the highest premiums. That's just the way it works. And Minsure is going to provide an opportunity for affordable health care premiums without multi-thousand dollar deductibles for a whole bunch of these folks in their 50s and their 60s. Uh, last week I was uh, at a consultation conference with uh, tribal elected officials and health and human services directors from uh, Wisconsin. And uh, I was on a panel and I was explaining uh, all of the things that Minnesota was doing and I could see the faces of the Wisconsin tribal leaders just get longer and longer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the disappointment was just uh, easily uh, readable. And, uh, I, you know, they, no uh, Medicaid expansion, no chance for a basic health plan, uh, no state-driven insurance board, no chance for tribal sponsorship. And so I really felt uh, sad about their discouragement, and, and I think they're just their bitter disappointment and so I wanted to say something that would give them some uh, encouragement or at least some empathy and uh, about all I could come up with was uh, now you know exactly what it feels like to be a Minnesotan at the end of the football season. <laughs>
support the direction of voluntary all-day kindergarten and funding that primarily? Or do you think that funding should just be increased to an arbitrary number and then districts be allowed to use that funding how they see best see fit? Well, I guess I tend to favor more of the latter approach just because I think districts know uh, maybe where they need to apply more funding and they also know the constraints of their particular uh, facilities. Um, some districts may wish to increase their all-day kindergarten um, classrooms, but they may not have actual physical space for those. So, you know, I think it, it does require us to say, well, you, you, we would like to see this um, extended because we think it's beneficial for, for kindergartners to be in um, all-day K, and I am a supporter of that. But we also have um, needs in the area pre-kindergarten um, as well, and, and if schools need to make some adjustments to how they use the funding, I think that's, that's a more beneficial um, method to do it. And in your private sector work, it was primarily as an electrical engineer, yet your committee selections don't really reflect this background. So do you plan to kind of marry your, your experience in that sector with future legislation? Um, you know, I've, I've got certainly an interest in technology. I worked in um, telecommunications and uh, internet services, and I definitely I still have an interest in those areas as well and seeing, you know, Minnesota, what, what can we do as a legislature to help, you know, develop those industries. Uh, but I guess right at the moment I don't have a particular um, issue that I would be saying, I, you know, I want to work on right now. But um, I think that having a technical background helps in in many areas of data analysis and um, so many of our um, committee responsibilities have to do with looking at a lot of information, taking it in and analyzing it quickly and I think my engineering background helps with that. So how would you encapsulate the session thus far? Um, well, it's been a real, really a whirlwind, <laughs> I have to say. It's been very exciting and there's um, a lot of events that happen that are um, first time doing um, these things, introducing bills or presenting bills in committees and um, going to some of the um, committees that I'm not on and presenting bills, you know, it's been, that's been um, interesting experiences. But then there's, there's a lot of work just to uh, feel like I'm keeping up with uh, the, all of the reading and the, the bills that we have to just um, take in and vote on. So. It's been it's been really an, an interesting experience so far. Any big surprises yet? Um, you know, it's just also different. It's more different from any job or work that I've done. So I I feel like I come to work and I I think well there's going to be some surprises today and you know I won't know uh, what's coming but but it's been it's been all right because I think everybody's in the same position. The new people we're we're all kind of experiencing it for the first time. Okay, Senator Melissa Wickland, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. appreciate it. Rain and sleet couldn't stop the return of these cannons from making the journey from New Ulm to the Capitol lawn. After a five-year hiatus, the New Ulm battery resumed what had become a tradition, hauling these 1850s cannons from their city to remind lawmakers and the public of how we received our freedoms. The people that see it, they always come over and ask questions. You know, when was the gun made? Where was it made? How old is it? Things such as that. Uh, the other reaction we get, we get, we get a lot of pictures of skies. All the people try to use their cameras. They always get a picture of the sky when the gun goes off because they get scared to jump up. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report. Mm -hmm.